as we move ahead in this journey of adaptation to innovation, it is now time for a panel discussion on reimagining the future, tech, talent, and purpose with a starlit group of leaders. Please join me in welcoming Dharmendra Kapoor, CEO, Birla Soft, Dr. Puneet Agarwal, CTO, Zensa Technologies, Raghav Gupta, MD, Coursera India and APAC, Suhail Bhatia, Director, HR Transformation, USD, as the session moderator. Welcome Dharmendra, Puneet, Raghav and Suhail, the frame is all yours. So thank you so much uh, for the introductions and uh, we'll straight away get into the panel discussion today. Uh, and uh, it, is, it is no secret that businesses are moving forward with a renewed strategy for absolute transformation. The compelling factors include technology-driven automation of processes, uh, the changing customer needs, new skills, uh, increasing employee expectations and, uh, and remote working. So, uh, you know, the new outlook uh, encompasses three pillars of technology, talent, and purpose. So in this session today, we will spotlight uh, on these three and uh, dive deep into how each one of these uh, will evolve in the future uh, to impact business and leaders. Uh, in, the, in the context of purpose, the, the rigid organizational structures of yesteryears is flattening, uh, leaders are re-questioning uh, the business's existence. They are rethinking the purpose in the new context. And the purpose has become even more important now uh, in the era of uh, millennials joining the workforce and looking for a larger purpose uh, uh, you know, to attach with organizations as well. Uh, for technology, the, the adoption and the adaption is on the rise to innovate new processes, uh, unleash the talent's productivity, uh, performance, experience, and development. And from a talent's perspective, uh, both technology and purpose must be aligned with the talent expectations uh, regarding engagement and working models and empower them throughout the journey. So in, in this context, the, the first question that comes in my mind is that the pace of transformation in the past two years has been incredibly robust. So uh, I would like to ask this question to DK. Uh, how have your business is changed? And what are these transformations that were not part of your original growth plans? And, and, and now suddenly they've become part of your plans. No, I think uh, uh, so well, it is very, very relevant uh, question uh, to the current times. As you said that the, uh, this, this I call that it, it is the years of disruption. Uh, two years back, we were questioning the pace of digitalization, and today we are really flowing it, flowing with it uh, like never before. Uh, uh, there is always this discussion comes that what is going to be the future ways of working, because there is so much that has shifted in a country where it was very difficult to imagine in most of the businesses or industries that the work from home could be a reality. Today, suddenly it looks like a norm where everybody is asking for it. And that is going to bring about sea changes in the way people work, in the way people communicate with each other, and the way people become productive and perform. So keeping that in mind, I think when it comes to the structure, while I know it is very, very important for the organization, I think we all have to learn, and I'm also learning in a big way, and our organization is learning in a big way, that how do we unstructure the structure? Because we have lived for ages in that hierarchical structure. Okay, I know there have been a lot of discussions about having the flat structures or, 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 or all those concepts that have been there around us. But unstructuring or untangling the structure is really needed now because it doesn't matter where people are the work is happening you don't need a manager to really banging on the head of people to get the job done okay they are not looking over our shoulders to tell us that 
this is the work that is required and how many hours somebody should be clocking in the office mm -hmm. so all that has suddenly gone away and has disappeared now i'm not sure when and how it is going to come back and how much it is going to come back because there are a lot of discussions around that but the most important part would be that the hierarchical structure will have to change i believe there will be more lateral structure that should come into the play the faster we learn it the better it would be we can continue to resist that change but that change is definitely going to hit us sooner or later so it is better that we start getting that addressed as part of the organization and that structure should really look at what are the roles what are the goals what is the performance expected those are the normal method through which we should determine whether the work will happen or not and what is required rather than how many number of hours somebody is clocking and do i have a manager who continues to look over my shoulder or not so i think those are some of the things that are going to change so i believe that it should be more peer structure that should come into the play now rather than a hierarchical structure and i think those are the transformational changes that are going to happen there are of course multiple other things that are changing i have just talked about the structure but i think the culture is going to be a big shift that is going to happen okay at the same time the change management that would be required i think the managers will have to be the change managers going forward rather than just looking at that there is some certain amount of work that i have to get it managed and i will get it managed and i'll tap on somebody's shoulder whether that work is being done or not so the project project managers or the manager will require to do much deeper planning and much granular planning in order for people to be productive while they are working from home or from anywhere absolutely dk and uh, i think some very important pertinent points that you put in there and uh, it's quite amazing when i see business leaders you know and ceos uh, talk so much about uh, you know what the kind of role that managers need to play and the kind of interest which is there in the culture the structure uh, as well so it's, it's kind of really exciting and one thing that really you know stuck with me what you mentioned about is what would be the role of a manager in this new environment right and and uh, it's not just going to be about you know as you mentioned looking over the shoulder and you know trying to get people uh, or, you know on 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 track it's going to be much more beyond that and one of the things that we've been trying to look at is that how do we translate the role of a manager into a coach support that with technology and how do we make sure that managers are actually coaching uh, their people in a digital environment and build that virtual trust uh with their with their employees and uh, technology can support uh but how do they kind of make sure that now uh, they are giving as you mentioned about uh, the right goals uh, you know granular planning uh, the regular feedback uh, and how did they use uh, technology to do that so it's kind of uh, very interesting and uh, you know really insightful uh, some of the points that you mentioned and that also means that you know this will require a lot of technology uh for us to do that right and uh, gone are the days when we used to think of technology as an enabler uh, and i guess now now it's almost a part of business strategy right i mean the kind of experience you want to create for employees uh, the kind of experience you want to create for customers uh, any of that to put life and blood into it i mean technology is is extremely extremely important uh so i mean and the challenge with technology is and now it is often being said that the half life of a new technology is about 12 months the the tech skill decay is 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 kind of happening so fast uh, and this puts immense pressure on an enterprise uh, to kind of you know how do they strive to stay relevant so two two important discussion points here and uh, maybe uh, puneet uh, you know if you could uh, kind of give a bit of an insight on that so how are you encouraging talent and how does one encourage talent to innovate processes and adapt new technologies and uh, really leverage uh, tech to unleash unleash their potential to really unlock their potential you know uh, what a relevant question uh, so here first of all uh, i want to thank you i want to thank ethr world for calling me to this panel and uh, coming to your question you know it's a very relevant point you made technology has become pervasive it's going through across all the layers whether it is business 
problem definition, user experience for that matter, if you see. I mean, user experience is not only UI technology anymore. There is AI in it. Mm. We want to show actionable intelligence. We want to preempt where user will click next, what user will do next, making it easy for them to use. Right. I mean, predicting the next user input on a keyboard has become commonplace, as you know, everywhere. Right. So, so AI is not only the you know predicting the uh, the sales for doing the sales forecasts, uh, doing the supply chain optimization. It's everywhere. It's pervasive now throughout the specs, the layers of technology. I mean, look at look at people are you habitual of using Amazon, right? Tremendous user interface. And, and uh, take entertainment for that matter. Some people call it entertainment on the go. We have seen tremendous change in the way the entertainment gets delivered to the consumers in the last two years. You know, everything is on the app. Uh, you know, TV uh, has ma made a significant change in the household, correct? And if you see, this, the, the, this change could happen with... A cloud adoption, tremendous user experience, and enabled by multiple layers of technology architecture coming together to deliver that experience. And that's the millennials' way of thinking. Now, trying to answer your question directly, uh, you know, setting the right vision, which is commensurate with the uh, millennials' way of thinking, this, this uh, you know, tech, like I said, the entertainment on the go, uh, and uh, fills the, this young talent with, an, with a new energy to unleash that potential. So that's that's my uh, you know uh, secret sauce, I would say. Uh, and in this manner, I should say companies like us, not only Zensar, or the whole industry, I should say, uh, the uh, can set the ball rolling for next gen next gen talent in a big way because we nurture talent in our companies in a big way, we hire freshers, we give them the environment, we give them problems. And that's sort of, uh, you also talked about some of these hot skills, et cetera, and uh, uh, what, are, what is uh, you know, coming further. So uh, my picks will be cloud native digital, like DK said, that's like on top of the leap, full stack development, analytics, AI, ML, uh, is becoming uh, the driving force for to further the business. Another big thing that is coming is machine learning operations. You know, young generation is is uh, picking this this uh, skill. DevOps, DevSecOps was there. Now MLOps is coming in a very very big manner, and we are seeing tremendous demand for such such skills. And you know, the whole engineering mindset, Suhail. Hmm. Coupled with the knowledge of, of mathematics, that, in my view, uh, has to be further propelled by the online learning uh, revolution that is being brought by Coursera of the world. Uh, we have Raga uh, with us, but, but I think that online re learning revolution will uh, bring about a positive change around engineering mindset. That's, that's a yet another thought I wanted to uh, share. No, that's 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 fantastic, Puneet. And there is there is so much food for thought. And I mean, you know, I'm I'm just becoming greedy to kind of talk up, you know, spend a bit more time on this particular question and you know, taking out some things from what you just mentioned, right? One, of course, you talked about uh the the hot skills, you talked about a lot of engineering new age technologies that people need to learn. But at the same point in time, you talked about the mindset that is required for one to a adapt and adopt those skills. But at the same point in time, how organizations are going to give a playground for people to be able to apply, experiment with those skills and create real value for the, uh, for the organization and for the clients of the organization. I think that's interesting. And uh, one thing that we struggled with was, was about that, you know, how do we encourage people to uh, innovate? How do we kind of, we, it's easy to get them on a course and get them to do the course, but how do we get them to actually practice something like that? And uh, and one thing that we've come up with very interesting thing is one, we've kind of uh, come up with this concept of high impact goals, <clears throat> which we decoupled with uh, innovation, uh, with which we decoupled with uh, uh, any punitive action. So there are certain high impact goals where people 
uh, uh, people get to implement the skills that they've, uh, they've developed, the hot skills that you mentioned about, and they get to innovate, they get to experiment with those skills. And those goals are decoupled from evaluation or any sort of financial implication. That kind of seeds in uh, the whole idea of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, we, we were talking about how do you encourage failure? How do you glorify failure? So how do you say fail fast and it's okay to fail? So the way we've tried to embed it by saying that it's okay to fail, because there are these goals which are which which you can set and it's okay to fail, but it's important to track certain failure metrics. So that's something that we've started doing. So you fail on a goal, but you also come up with failure metrics that we track in terms of what was the learning? Is there a knowledge asset that we can get created through this? How much uh, you know uh, investment did we lose? How can we kind of reroute some of that uh, learnings that we did? to building something different, et cetera, right? So, so that's interesting, but, but the question still stays in my, uh, in my head is that, you know, one, of course, I want to know more, uh, maybe Raghav, if you could tell us a bit more about what's really hot today as a, as a skill set, uh, what is in the green shoots and something that you expect that the world will need more of in the next three to four years. And is it only engineering skills? Or there is something more to it. I mean, what your what's your perspective on that, Raghav? Sure, sir. He'll happy to share some perspective. And before that, on a lighter note, I want to say, you know, I was hoping by this time we would be doing some of these events in person, but we're all obviously still virtual with Omicron and all of that. But it's really amazing to listen to DK and to yourself and Puneet and already get such a such a rich conversation started. Um, so I'll share a little bit of what we are seeing. And I have the benefit of, uh, I would say, a large data set, right? Uh, there are crores of people who come to Coursera to learn. There are hundreds of companies and um, universities who teach on Coursera. And then there are thousands of com companies who learn on Coursera as well. Um, and uh, let me share a little bit of what you what we're seeing around specifically the question that you asked, right, which is what's hot today and how are we seeing skills uh, changing. Um, so one of the things that we, I mean, you could come to Coursera and learn thousands of things, right? If you've been on the platform, there are just thousands of skills one could learn. But what we did was when the pandemic started, we said, look, there are thousands of skills one could learn, but let's look at what are the top things that working professionals are learning, right? Because they're also students. So let's, let's leave students out for a moment. Let's look at what are the uh, top 10 skills that working professionals are learning on Coursera. And pre-pandemic, a lot of these were broadly functional skills, technology skills. Number one was Python. Number two was neural networks. Number three was algorithms. There was a bit of business strategy. Then there was deep learning. There was a bit of communication, supply chain, and then cloud and sales and so on. So those were the top 10 skills. But you know, over the last year and a half, or almost two years now, when the pandemic hit, we again looked at the same data and said, look, across clause of people, what are people learning on our platform, working professionals specifically, during the pandemic. And writing used to be number seven, it became number one. Business strategy used to be uh, five, it became number two. Python used to be number one, it became number three. But interestingly, after that was mindfulness, meditation, gratitude, kindness, listening, and then there was a bit of technology, there was a bit of learning as well, right? And so if I look at these two columns, what was functional and technology became largely human, became largely business strategy, became largely, uh, you know, uh, skills like that. And the shift was pretty stark, you know, when we saw this across a large database of crores and crores of people. And so we also looked externally to say, what is the rest of the world saying, you know, as to what the future might look like? And obviously none of us knows in this, you know, quickly changing changing world, what the future might look like. But it, it's interesting what the World Economic Forum says, right? They say by 2025, some of the top skills that we will need will be a combination of digital and human. And which is what this 2019 and 2020 data kind of points to, that it used to be a lot of digital, it became a lot of human, but you know, gradually, whenever we get out of the pandemic, we will need things like analytical thinking and innovation, which is what the World Economic Forum talks about. We will need the ability to learn as a lifelong learner, as a key skill. We will need complex problem solving, critical thinking, and so on. But we will also need 
technology use. We will also need, you know, technology design. We will also need resilience, stress, and flexibility. And if I were to summarize this, right, it's fairly safe to say that the essential skills of the future for all of us as working professionals are going to be a combination of digital and human skills. I think that's what the data is telling us so far, I would say a little bit. That is that is that is really really insightful, right? I mean, how do you and you mentioned about how it was more about the uh, I mean, pardon me for using the word soft skills uh, to getting more into engineering skills, and now it is human plus digital, and how do we really embed humanness back into uh, technology? It's, it's kind of really interesting, uh, Raghav. It also and, and if I may quickly add one additional point before uh, you go go ahead, and because. DK is here and Puneet is here and as business leaders, they'll appreciate this more, right? So, um, you know, for public companies, how your business is performing is measured by your stock, right? And uh, obviously as shareholders, uh, you're looking at public companies and saying, look how the business is performing. One of the things that we did last year is we plotted the stock performance of a company mm -hmm. with the skill proficiency existing within a company. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, when people come and learn on Coursera, we are able to measure their skill proficiency. We said, okay, let's do a chart, which is stock performance and skill proficiency. And the great thing is the answer was as expected, right? So companies with higher skill proficiency are the ones who performed better mm -hmm. through the course of the pandemic. So this was one of those cases where we went in with a strong hypothesis that, you know, the best performing companies will be on the top right, right? Best performing stocks and highest proficiency. But the data proved it across 2000 odd companies, which I thought was really interesting. And I thought, let me mention it uh, for DK and Puneet's uh, absorption as well. It is It is actually very interesting. It is actually very interesting. Uh, very good point, Raghav. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the causality of uh, talent uh, and, uh, you know, skilling talent uh, and the business value that it generates, I think that causality is getting hardened and much more clearer uh, by the day. Uh, and one of the interesting points that, uh, you know, Puneet also mentioned earlier uh, was about the millennial uh, workforce. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I was actually reflecting back on, you know, the points that are being discussed. And I looked at the millennial workforce, uh, how important it is for them to have a purpose, how important it is for them uh, uh, to have a good experience. The tolerance for low experience is very, very low because you talked about entertainment on the go, learning on the go, and therefore everything is on the go. And then there is the FOMO, which is the fear of missing out, uh, which is also at play. Uh, in that kind of a scenario and, and, the, and the wiring between uh, talent and uh, uh, business success, as Raghav mentioned, also getting hardened and the consciousness of our talent expanding uh, and they kind of wanting to do a purpose. So uh, I probably want DK to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, give some perspective on that, that how do you unleash the potential of an individual to make a significant minimal impact uh, on, on business? I mean, how do you do that in a scenario like this? Yeah, no, I think uh, Raghav mentioned the very uh, good data point that, that there is a correlation between the strong performance and the skill uh, uh, that resides in an organization. Uh, you know, uh, and, and it, is, it is a well-known uh, uh, discussion between a CEO and a CFO, uh, where the CFO said that, what if we train people and they leave? And CEO said that, what if we don't train and they stay back? Okay. Uh, and it is, it is, a, it is a, a big reality today because I don't think that we can uh, continue to wait for the talent to get developed outside our boundary. We need to really look at that. How do we go and continue to upskill? How do we continue to reskill people? It is in fact a responsibility of a leader today to continue to do that planning and continue to give ample opportunities to employees so that they can reskill and upskill themselves. Uh, one of the uh, you know question that was asked to me many years back that what is that you want to become five years down the line? You know, it is a very typical question at the time of the interview, somebody from HR will ask that DK, what do you want to become uh, in five years time? 
I said, I don't know about that, but I definitely want to say relevant. Okay. I think that is a bigger reality today because technology is changing very, very fast. So today, if uh, one particular skill is in demand, okay, it could become completely obsolete 12 months down the line. And there is something else that is really uh, getting into the fashion. Why I'm calling it fashion is that a lot of time that is how it begins, but then it takes a considerable shape over a period of time. But the millennials are looking at what is that they can continue to get as a knowledge or as a skill very, very quickly online because that is what is going to be the method of educating the young generation. Not that the school are, schools are going to go out of fashion. No, the colleges are not going to go out of fashion. But in my opinion, the biggest part of the learning, learning the harder skills is going to come by studying on their own, by self-study as well as studying online. And that the reason the education technology is going to pick up the pace very, very fast going forward. And I'm not talking about only a relationship between a, uh, a student and, and the company who is providing the content. It is also that the schools are going to ask for the content from these companies so that they can become more effective. Would they continue to not really look at that the teachers also go and reskill themselves very, very fast, it is going to happen. If until today we were going and hiring the freshers and training them on our campus or on our company, now we are going back to the colleges and saying that can the last semester or last one year be based on the needs that we have. And I believe that is not going to remain last semester or last one year it is going to go back by one and a half year or two years that the last two years of the colleges where the companies are going to collaborate with the colleges so that we teach the students what is required to become more and more productive when they become an employee. So I think all that is going to happen. There is a lot that is happening in that space. I believe there's a biggest need today that the colleges, the students, the teachers, the companies and every other uh, stakeholder gets connected. So probably there is a need for a new LinkedIn for talent. And I'm sure that sooner or later it is going to come into the shape. I think it's a great point. So Helen, if I can just complement that or supplement what DK just shared with a little bit of what we are seeing with some data as well, right? And it surprises people when I say this, but pre-pandemic, of the close of people who were coming to learn on Coursera, 90% were working professionals. 10% were students in colleges. Very few were actually students in colleges. And when I you know, say back that, look, when I was a student, I only took what was mandatory. I did not take anything that was optional. That used to be the case on Coursera as well. But what's amazing is that through the course of the pandemic in India, we have had 1,100 campuses where 15 lakh students have taken 1.5 crore courses on Coursera. And this is exactly what DK is saying that along with what students are learning on campuses, students are complementing that in participation with their campuses. So vice chancellors in campuses are saying, look, along with what we will teach you, you know, come to a platform like Coursera and learn Python, learn machine learning and topics like that. And that's why we've seen this explosion. It was very little pre-pandemic, but we've seen this to the extent of 15 lakh like students who are now learning on an online platform. And I think it's happening because the kind of messages that students are getting from companies about skills of the future and the kind of opportunities that exist in the future has changed so quickly that it is permeating down to actually motivation at a student level as well. So it's massive change that is currently, I would say, underway in talent pipelines across the country as well. Well, that, that's that's fantastic and you know that that's that's the wonderful thing about data you know it kind of sometimes also corrects perception and uh, my perception was up till now what raghav you mentioned that you know at least students are going to do courses which are mandated uh, for them and uh, you know uh, but at the same time uh, data corrects perception perception also corrects data at, at, at some point in time 
two two things which are which i'm kind of you know trying to uh, solve in my head uh, one is about uh, going back to you know what what puneet mentioned about uh, the millennials and and the fact that you know it's also important to give them what they want to learn uh, not just what the organizations uh, or the environment around them would want to learn so which means technology would also have to achieve uh, something which is which is a bit of an oxymoron but mass personalization of learning uh, and the and that will require a lot of investment from from business leaders while intuitively we all understand that is important and the data that raghav you also mentioned about having a strong correlation between stock prices going up and the skill proficiency of of the uh, of the organization skills but still we do need more uh, more and more data uh, which is which is also causal in nature uh, you know and establishes the causality uh, between uh, you know investments in skilling and such initiatives uh, as well as the business success so what are some of the uh, metrics that uh, you know should we, we should we could track uh, possibly to instill more confidence of 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 business leaders let's say you know if i have to go to you know dk and you know one is of course you know i know uh, you know dk might say that you know just because something can be measured don't measure it intuitively it is the right thing to do so do it right uh, that is that is what i understand from dk's persona right but but there are other leaders as well who will say you know show me the numbers so uh, so what is it that you know uh, puneet maybe if you could start with that and then we could go to raghav and and and, and dk in the end to say what what uh, data points we can show to instill confidence in these initiatives so for sure uh, sohel this always is a very important question always being asked so uh, very pertinent i should say the first i think if it comes to innovation the first thing we all recognized a while ago was that ability to embrace failure right so i think that's a very very important metric for us to carefully observe and uh, to see you know lack of failure means we are not ambitious enough and all the failure naturally doesn't mean good so there's a right balance of failure is what is definitely needed second and most importantly uh, is the uh, business impact you know when we do innovation projects when we learn new technologies can we convert these co innovation can we convert some of these trials into real business for our customers not always with the magnitude of the business but the number of initiatives that get get converted into business that actually improves the quality of conversation that you carry out with your customers that increases your your mind share with the customer and their business drivers and their challenges you know in the in line with the current technology fashion like like the dk said fashion also matters so that that in my view is a very important measure and finally i would say most important in today's time when the tech talent is at a premium and attrition is at all time high levels if by investing into technology and and learning we are able to retain talent that's like the biggest take away or biggest metric in my view right if we are able to retain talent by by giving them because that's what they aspire to they want to learn new technology they want to learn new things and if we are able to give them that environment they stay back and that in my view is a very very important metric you know can we hold people can we uh, uh, can we check this attrition levels yeah that that will be my uh, top 2 3 uh, takeaways uh, from the metrics point of view so yeah. that that's that's fantastic uh, puneet uh, raghav uh, you you've kind of you know stating so much of data points so what 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 are those data points that we can go back yeah. to business leaders to encourage them to invest yeah the good news is it's it's very doable uh, uh, so hill it's very doable to put a very tangible business case around learning i'd love to echo two of the points that uh, you know were just shared and add to as well i think the first one which is you know what i would say delivering on business goals by building critical skills right and uh, an example which i really like right we work with this bank in singapore and they said we've done a study if we acquire a retail customer through a digital channel the lifetime value of the digital customer digitally acquired customer is much more than a customer that we acquire through a physical 
retail channel. This is pre-pandemic, right? So one of the objectives of our learning program is to increase digitalization, to be able to acquire more customers digitally. And then they went back and measured that. So being as specific as that, but I mean, that's just an example, but I think one clear uh, element is, you know, did you deliver on your business goals, right? As an IT services company, you said, look, 30% of my business with clients is digital. I want to take it to 36%. Did you get the talent pipeline to be able to do that or not? Second, which I think uh, was just shared, which is realizing the full value of technology investments, right? As a part of digital transformation, crores and billions of dollars is being spent by companies. There's an Accenture study which says that of these billions of dollars which is being invested, only about 15, 20% is being realized. And the reason for that is people are not skilled on the technology that is being implemented in their companies. We launched something called guided projects uh, last year, where you can actually come and learn hands-on a technology on a virtual platform. So can actually a learning platform realize the full value of your technology company, whether you're a tech services provider or whether you're a business yourself, whether you're a healthcare company, company or a retail company and so on. So I think that to me is the second one. The third, uh, I think Puneet shared already, which is uh, improving employee retention and engagement. Uh, I think that completely applies. And the fourth one I would add is actually reducing talent acquisition costs. So actually building a pipeline for some of your hard to fill roles, whether those are data or cloud or ML or whatever those roles might be, but actually building a pipeline towards reducing talent acquisition costs. Absolutely, absolutely. Fantastic. Uh, Raghav, we do at uh, UST as well look at uh, how do we optimize our talent supply chain. And one of the key matrices is around the internal versus external fulfillment uh, of, of demand, right? And how do we make sure that the internal demand is is kind of fulfilling most of our uh, internal talent is fulfilling most of our, uh, our demand that is coming in. So really fantastic. DK, uh, the, the last word to you uh, in terms yeah. of uh, what as a business leader you would you would get convinced with. Yeah, no, I think uh, both, uh, uh, you know, uh, Raghav and Puneet have mentioned the obvious measures that as a business leader that uh, I would go and put it. But uh, let me take a step back and uh, relook at that, uh, the whole thing. If I expect people to remain relevant, I am sure that people also would want the business to remain relevant. Okay, They would want the process and policies to remain relevant. That means that they would expect that these are going to change with time. Okay. So that is going to be very, very crucial. I am not the one who is going to wait for me to know whether it is going to give the benefit or not. As you rightly said that, that if I expect that this is the right thing to do, I would go and do it anyway. I am one person who believes in, you know, uh, uh, you first fake it and then make it. Okay. Uh, having said that, what it means is that if I have the ability to imagine it, if I have the ability to, uh, you know, uh, anticipate in advance, then that means I can be far ahead of time in taking the right decisions. And I think this is the time when we have to anticipate what is going to change going forward. The digitalization is happening to most industries. So there is no reason to believe that the digitalization will not hit the IT industry. It is going to hit equally hard to IT industry also. So we will have to also digitalize every single process, whether it is talent acquisition or it is talent retention or upskilling or reskilling, anything that is required around the talent need to digitalize. And that is what will happen. So we have to look at what is going to change with respect to the way we will engage with our employees? What is the method through which we will engage with our clients? What is the method through which we will partner with the others like the OEMs in order to become more and more effective? So every single value chain of the business will have to be relooked at, has to be reimagined. You know, as I say that, that if we had to really bring about the change, we have to catch the weaker signals much in advance because everybody can catch the stronger signals. But the problem is by the time you catch the stronger signals, it is already very, very late. So we should have the ability as a leader to catch the weaker signals. 
be prepared up front don't wait for the business case whatever changes are required do it on the fly i am sure that we will learn how to measure it as we go forward but i think the change has to happen and i think this is the right time to actually make the change also because everything is changing the change is very very acceptable today across the uh, you know uh, ecosystem so i think uh, uh, we need to bring about that very very quickly and ensure that we are instilling the confidence in our employees while bringing those changes so this is this is really music to my ears uh, you know they say that you know words are uh, are an index of one's mindset and mindset drives actions right so so what you said about fake it and make it and uh, you know it's it's like about you no know, don't look for causes uh for a particular effect so make the effect and causes will follow uh you know it, it's it's something really interesting and uh, i really enjoyed the conversation today uh you know uh, all business leaders you know fantastic insights we had data we had the logic and uh, uh, we had some very interesting arguments being marshaled uh, in support of uh, how do we make sure that there is a certain strong purpose Uh, that the organization articulates uh, for its own self for its own existence uh, so that that uh, acts like a lighthouse like a true north for the organization to always move towards that and at the same point in time to attract the millennial talent the talent of today which wants to solve world problems uh, through their skills a purpose is extremely important to inspire them and make them stay with you i think that was something which was very clear on the panel today uh, the second important part is the role of technology Uh, which is no longer an enabler but it kind of is very much a part of your business strategy is what i understood from all of you here on the on, on the panel today uh, and that uh, whether it is employee experience whether it is uh, it designing the experience of your clients customers uh, technology is going to help you do that not just create that unique experience but it that experience can also be individualized uh, through technology uh, uh, but the secret sauce still remains how do you Um, you know kind of uh, intertwine that with the humanness and the human touch is extremely important and lastly it's it's the talent uh, earlier it was it was only a few leaders at the top which at a philosophical level understood that it is very important during the war of talent etc that you know it's important to ring fence talent but i think now that it's become much more uh, concrete it's no longer abstract i think uh, it not just at a philosophical level but even at a first line manager level people understand uh, the importance of talent and the role that they have to play to embed coaching into the system to embed you know embed care into the system embed learning into the system so that people really uh, uh, you know kind of unlock their true potential so uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, for these insights uh and it was a wonderful uh, you know 40 45 minutes uh, you know uh, spent by me uh, i learned a lot uh, from this panel i hope our audiences also when they go through uh, i would encourage them to pause rewind uh, you know relook at some of the things that were said and make notes uh because i think this is something which is which is going to really make a difference if you are a talent professional if you're a business leader i think today's conversation was extremely relevant uh, so thank you so much once again Thank you everyone for such a gripping session around the CXO perspective. Stay tuned as there is much more such content coming your way during the course of these two days. Do share your learnings with your friends and colleagues using the hashtag #ETHRNextTech.